This film explores how textiles worked within early modern domestic interiors, what their visual impact was and how their original viewers might have responded to them. It is the result of a collaboration between the Wealdon Down and Open Air Museum and the University of Kent, and builds on the findings of a network of researchers who have worked on these questions over the last two years as part of a project called Ways of Seeing the English Domestic Interior, sponsored by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. In the course of the film, you will hear about the different kinds of evidence we have for how people lived in these houses in the past, the documents about their lives and the buildings themselves, and how we can use current craft practices and digital media to explore them creatively. We hope this will give you a sense of the relationship between objects, spaces and the way people interacted with them that offers new insights into what it felt like to live in this kind of house. In this film, you will see three people. Catherine Richardson, reader in Renaissance Studies at the University of Kent. Danae Tankard, social historian at the Weald and Downland Open Air Museum. And artist Melissa White. Bayleaf is a late medieval open hall house, originally from Chiddingston in Kent, moved to the museum in the late 1960s when it was facing demolition. In the late 1980s, it was furnished to create a domestic interior as it might have been around 1540. The furnishings, all of which are replica, included a woven woolen damask cloth to hang from the dais beam at the high end of the hall. After a quarter of a century on display, the cloth had faded and deteriorated to a state where it couldn't be repaired, and in 2013 a decision was made to replace it. We chose to replace the cloth with a painted one. We know that houses like Bayleaf would have had at least one and probably several painted cloths decorating their interiors. Unlike tapestries, which were only found in the houses of the wealthy, painted cloths were common even in lower status dwellings. They were mass produced and relatively cheap. However, very few painted cloths survive because of the thin and perishable nature of the material. So in choosing a design for our cloth, we turned instead to evidence from domestic wall paintings, which survive in relatively high numbers. Although many wall paintings are too fragmentary to base a design on, we were able to find a suitable scheme surviving in all three hall, a 16th century house in Flintshire, Wales. The wall paintings, located in a first floor chamber, have been dated to around 1550, in other words, close to the 1540 date that Bayleaf is interpreted to. The task of bringing the scheme to life as a painted cloth was undertaken by Hastings-based artist Melissa White. The original design is pretty battered. It's had a lot of wear and tear. It was discovered in, I believe, 1980 and hasn't had major restoration on it. So I'm working essentially from various photographs of the original and it's kind of a detective game trying to work out what the design was and how it was painted and in what order the colours were painted but then once one gets going you get the flow and pick up the, the nuances that the artist had in the first place which is quite nice to get into that space. It's imitating paint fabric and which would have been very expensive and the design itself seems to represent an alternating stripe one which has got a trellis with flowers within the trellis and the other stripe is representing a, a pomegranate on a meandering stem both of which are very um, typical designs and certainly the meandering pomegranate we see in quite a lot of um, expensive cut velvets from Italy and, and all of these designs ultimately originate in the Middle East. So the kind of paint I'm using is distemper paint. Essentially it's rabbit skin glue and natural powder pigments, which is exactly what would have been used by the paint stainers and the people doing these wall paintings and painted cloths. It's a really simple basic paint. So what we're starting with is uh, rabbit skin glue granules, which is basically the hooves, the skin, all those parts of an animal that are just creating this, this gelatin essentially. And this acts as a really strong glue, in fact. This is what I've used to prime the canvas, and it's what a lot of artists still use to prime a canvas before painting on it. And then you simply add powder pigments to that to get your colours. So you have your lamp black, which was dead cheap, um, created by burning a pot, and then the powder that, the soot that gathered on the bottom of a pot, that's your lamp black. Um, and then we have 
the white, which comes from, uh, it's called whiting, it's basically just chalk. And then the red ochre is an earth pigment. Red ochre, yellow ochre is also an earth pigment. And then we have our mystery colour, which is this orange called vermilion, which is originally a mercuric sulphide. So it's a toxic pigment. So for this particular project, I've used a substitute um, vermilion, which gives you exactly the same colour without the toxins. There are obviously different degrees of how authentic one can be with the traditional techniques. So whilst I'm using the same uh, rabbit skin glue and the same pigments that were used, obviously I'm using modern brushes. As I don't know what kind of brushes they would have used exactly at the time, but I do look very closely at the, the, the brush strokes. Sometimes on some wall paintings you can see they were using very bristly brushes, so very, they're very spiky brush strokes, very quickly and loosely done. Um, other times, like in this one, they're quite... Um, blobby for want of a better word so it's quite a soft brush so that you're getting quite nice tips um, but then also I look at the seeds and the pomegranates and uh, you can see where the brush would have been kind of loaded with paint and then it, it runs out of paint after you've done a few spots so you get strong spots and then weaker spots. There are about three different thicknesses of white so there's a very washy one that's on the the feathery bits and then there is a very thick paint, a thick white that goes on at the end to highlight so it's trying to get those um, thicknesses and thinnesses of paint is important. Um, so the texture of the canvas sort of dries the brush out a little bit more than, than on a wall, having painted on walls and on canvas um, the paint behaves very differently. So there, there are elements of trying to reproduce it as closely as this and then there are elements where it inevitably will be a bit different. Obviously we can't exactly replicate the kind of fabric that would have been painted on in the 16th century. So we know that it was generally quite a slubby, open woven kind of fabric. So I've chosen a uh, medium loom state, an unbleached linen. Um, it's quite a rough, quite a thick fabric rather than anything that's too lovely and perfect. I've then pr reproduced the width of the painter cloth to represent uh, as if I was using a 54 inch wide loom width. So the panels are 45 inches wide. I've hand stitched them, so the fabric's not authentic, but the stitching and the width is authentic. Late medieval open hall houses like Bayleaf were laid out according to a standard domestic plan with service rooms, here the buttery and the pantry are what was considered the lower end of the house, separated from the rest of the house by a cross passage or entry. The hall was effectively divided into a lower and an upper end. The upper end was the best part of the house. Its status enhanced by furnishings as well as the use of decorative timber framing such as the moulded dias beams from which the painted cloths would have hung. Here, Catherine Richardson and Danae Tankard discuss evidence for who lived in Bayleaf in the 16th century and how open halls like this one were furnished. So can you tell us a bit about the person who would have lived in a house like this? Well, we have quite good evidence for the people who were living in Bayleaf in the 16th century and it was successive members of the Wells family so we have Thomas Wells then Edward Wells and then Thomas Wells again so throughout the whole of the 16th century and they seem to have had a long lease so they had sort of un continuity in their tenancy and they were yeoman farmers they weren't particularly posh but they were quite comfortably off um, and that would have been reflected in their standard of living. So the long lease, does that mean that they had quite low rents through the period? They were able to invest more in their domestic interiors? Well, we don't know anything about their spending patterns because there's no sort of documentary evidence that would tell us about that. But yes, they were paying a fixed rent of £5, 10 shillings a year, and that stayed the same for the entire duration of the 16th century, which is how we know they Gosh. had a long tenancy. When you look at a probate inventory, which effectively is just a, is just a list of uh, movable items, um, they're usually itemised by room, so you get the room name, then you get the list of goods, and they show the way the appraisers move around the house, but they always start with the most important room, which of course was the hall, which is the room that we are situated in now. And the first items of furniture, which are always listed, are the table and its frame, and then you have a form or a bench, which is what we're sitting on now. Quite often, they will then move on to the hanging, and that is uh, what we see behind us. Um, and um, this was definitely the most important part of the hall, and presumably intended to sort of attract the eye upwards as you sort of came into the house. So, in fact, this is this is the highlight of the room. This is where the eye is drawn, and there's some evidence, isn't there, from these documents that the people who were pricing the objects saw this as a sort of group. 
that appears to be the case, and it is consistent in probate inventory evidence that, that it, it is always listed like this, which suggests that, yes, they, they, they were sort of seen as the, the sort of most important items within the hall. In some houses, there's evidence of um, a raised platform or a dais, so you're effectively you're sitting up. Yeah. Um, and then if you think about it, you've got these double height windows just at this end of the hall, so they're illuminating this end, and effectively yeah. you've got this kind of backdrop. And so it, it's like a stage, although again, I would sort of say it may be like a stage, but it's also this is also a pragmatic space. So. Yes, yeah, so in fact, this view that you're getting as we sit here yeah. um, has to define his status as yes. soon as you see it, doesn't it? And that presumably is why cloths like this are so important. Yes. Looking at the documents alongside Melissa's exploration of how craftsmen worked on these cloths has helped us to find new ways of displaying these houses to the public. The replacement of the shabby and faded woven cloth with a new painted cloth has transformed the bayleaf interior. From its foundation, the museum has always sought to achieve as high a degree of authenticity in its representation of the past as is possible, and those involved with this project feel that they have upheld this core principle with a replica painted cloth. Now that the cloth is up, we can learn much more about the way it works within the space, and recreating the past in its material form helps us to understand how the occupants of houses like Bayleaf would have responded to their domestic environment. So in the final part of this film, Melissa White and Catherine Richardson think about the visual impact of painted cloths on both the modern and the 16th century viewer. It has a very framing effect because of the colours, and I thought the colours were very bright when I was painting it, but when you see it in this context, they actually seem to suit the coloration in the room strangely where you have the various earth pigments that are naturally occurring in the in the plaster work I've sort of picked out here a little bit the yellow ochres and the reds and it works yeah <laughs> which is what about the distance of viewing then because I've been quite struck moving around this space how different this cloth looks standing by the door mm. walking past uh, yep. through the screens passage um, and then standing where we're standing now which it seems to me to look very, very different in the detail. There is an optimum point as you're getting closer to it where it takes on a different character, I think. Right. And I prefer it from a distance. And then as you come closer, it becomes a bit more, for want of a better word, crude in the painting style because it was done in a, in a certain way. It was painted in quite a fast way without attention to detail. I mean, they weren't obsessing with the minutiae. Right. So when you zoom close in, there isn't really an awful lot more to see. Right. Whereas with some artwork, you'll go the closer, the more you zoom in on it, mm. the, more you, the more you gain. Whereas here, it really is about the whole impact and the scale of it and the colour. Where do you think the optimum point is? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think when you're sitting at the table, we were sitting there earlier and looking over our shoulder and it, it doesn't really work when it's that close. So yeah. it, it, it is at sort of the viewing level, I suppose, as, as guests are being welcomed. It's sort right. of a guest level, I suppose. We've actually got a contemporary quote about um, uh, what these cloths were thought to do in the period. This is from William Harrison in his very famous book, The Description of England of 1577, so a bit later, but the same kind of cloths, I think. And he says, the walls of our houses on the inner side be either hanged with tapestry, arras work, or painted cloths, wherein either diverse histories or herbs, beasts, knots, and such like are stained, whereby the rooms are not a little commended, made warm, and much more close than otherwise they would be. Hmm. Does that tell us something about what these cloths are trying no, to do? I think that word close is interesting, isn't it? Because they're so big. Mm. Sort of brings people into contact. Yeah. And there's a coziness actually, yeah. which there wasn't in this room before. I think when you have this much colour and pattern, it just makes it more cozy. And I think that's why we decorate our interiors, to give that detail and um, interest into a room. The main thing here is that it's brand new, yep. it's not been distressed, it's not been knocked back. Um, in time, obviously, it will darken a little with all the soot coming from the fire mm. um, and people handling it, but at the moment it's pristine and that's unusual and it's a bit of a shock to the system. Mm. And I think actually it's very hard to picture life in a house like this because nowadays our lives are so full of pattern mm. and upholstered furniture and there's colour and pattern everywhere. So we can't really relate to this sort of space when it's so stark, I think. Mm. So this gives us a little bridge into, oh, actually there was pattern and this is how it would have been to live with it. Yes. Mm. So it gives people a completely different way of engaging with this space yeah, to the, yeah. the cloth that was there before, which yeah. was very muted. Yes, and I think what brings it full circle is to be able to show visitors the original wall painting that inspired this, 
and to explain that this is not a fantasy, this is how it would have been and this is the reference and um, these are the colours and this is as close as we can get. Yes, and then when we start to put that kind of skill that you've used in, in drawing out these ways of painting together with the inventory evidence that we have that shows the types of furniture and mm. objects that would have been in front of it uh, and gives us some suggestion of the way in which the rooms would have been laid out, yeah. we really start to get a sense of how this space operated as a household, don't yeah. we? Absolutely.